for coming today. And uh, we couldn't have ordered up better weather. I thought it would, might be a little bit too hot, but then it just cooled down to the right temperature at the right time uh, for folks. So uh, I love what I do. Um, I, I get excited every day about the people I get to work with, the families we get to serve, and the ideas that we get to bring to life. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the Autism Center is really unique in that it is a student-driven endeavor. So we have Dr. Anna Krasno over here, uh, who's just phenomenal and super talented. I hope you have a chance to have a conversation with her as well. Um, helping me lead a team of very talented doctoral students, and we're kind of picking these folks from all over the country, stealing them away, and we get them for a short while. We get to train them up in cutting-edge research methods, but then also in clinical strategies, actually the practical art and science of helping families. Um, and it's, it's fantastic to see not only providing support and services for families, but at the same time training this next generation that, that can then go out and replicate what we do in other states and other countries and uh, really have this um, impact just continue to spread as, as they kind of progress through. Um, and so some of the programs that we um, build, one of them is really on uh, early intervention. So we're really keen on families at the point of initial diagnosis, there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of questions about, um, will my child learn how to talk, right? Will my, will my child connect with me? Um, and when they transition then to school, there's questions about, will they be by themselves? Will they make friends? Will they be okay in the classroom? And um, as you continue to kind of progress through the years, there's, there's new questions that come up. So will they, how independent will they be? Will they be able to hold down a job? Will they be able to have a boyfriend or girlfriend if they want one? Um, uh, and kind of ultimately, what, what is gonna be their, their quality of life? And so we've kind of designed programs to really target some of these needs. And so um, autism is often characterized by its deficits, what a child can't do. And, and it's true that uh, there is a lot of vulnerabilities there. Some are individuals are nonverbal, have difficulties with making friends, connecting with others. Uh, there might be some sensory challenges or being rigid, um, needing help with flexibility. But there's also tremendous strengths. And I think oftentimes we don't pay enough attention to the strengths that can actually be utilized when we're thinking about how to intervene therapeutically. And so one of the first things that we do with, say, a young kid um, is thinking about, okay, what are their interests? What are they drawn to more so than anything else in this world? And for some, it's Magnetile, some it's Paw Patrol, <laughs> some um, it's Pokemon. And we're gonna use those interests to do something that the child has maybe never done in their entire life. So for nonverbal kids, that's talking. And so we might hold up their favorite toy, teach them the word for that toy, and then we wait. And the cogs start turning in their head, and they're like, well, I really want that toy. And so we might model the word. Let's say we say truck, and eventually the kid learns how to say the word truck because that unlocks something powerful. That unlocks the ability to play with the thing they care the most about in the world. And so we can take someone who maybe didn't have uh, language to begin with, suddenly they're motivated enough to start using language for the first time. Or we can take that interest, put a social spin on it, and get them to connect with parents for the first time. And we're not done there. Obviously, as we kind of continue up through development, there's different initiatives for different ages. And so at the school age level or at the high school level, there's often this, will my kid be by themselves? Will they have a friendship group, right? We, we all need our people <laughs> um, for, for the good times, but especially for the bad times. And uh, we often need help making those initial connections. And so what we're often charged with is, okay, how do we teach people both the skills, those competencies, but then also the, competen the, the confidence to be able to use those skills um, when they need to be used. And so that motivation piece is just as important. And so what we've uh, done with teenage uh, individuals is instead of saying, hey, you need a social skills group. Who wants to come after school and work on their social skills? Any, any takers, anyone? Uh, no. So, but, but what we do is we create a context, a club environment where kids actually want to be there. 
And so we create something built around their interests. First of all, we get pizza, we get <laughs> their favorite games. We create something that is run by undergrads, by other high school students, and we create a context where they actually want to be there. They want to be there more than anywhere else. And so then they actually have um, a space to be able to socially engage, to experiment, to try and fail, uh, and be able to talk to that person again because that person isn't gonna ghost them and disappear to go hang out with somebody else. And so when we look at this through a research lens, we have to, our, we have to quantify, okay, how much better did they get as a, a part of being in these groups? And so we do a number of things. We ask parents, hey, did they get better? And never the parents will say, yes, they're awesome now, great. <laughs> Parents tend to be a little bit biased, too. They're like, yeah, that was great. They're, they're wonderful. So we also ask the teens themselves. We're like, hey, did you get better? We're like, yeah, we're awesome. And we're like, yeah, we can't quite trust that as well. Because, you know, if you ask any teen how awesome they are, they're going to rate themselves five out of five. Okay? So we do some other ways to kind of measure social progress, too. So we actually have them have conversations with people they've never met before. And we video record that. And then we can actually dissect those conversations to look at, okay, um, objectively speaking, are they using the skills that we know are tied to people with high levels of social competency? And so we can actually compare someone at the start to where they are later on in life and in a more objective way show, yes, they're using the skills that they should be using, okay? But we're not done yet, right? Because we're gonna actually have show other people these videos and be like, hey, look at these individuals. I want you to rate how comfortable they seemed, how confident they seemed, how likely are they to have friends, okay? How awkward were they? And so these are people that have no investment whatsoever. We're not bribing them to kind of give us good rating, but these are folks that have no horse in the race. Mm -hmm. And they are seeing um, social competency. They're, they're rating these people much higher afterwards. And so, what we're trying to do is construct this kind of comprehensive picture of, of social competence and social success, right? On multiple different levels. And then as a final kind of capstone, we also just survey, hey, how many friends do we have now, okay? And so we wanna look at that real world impact too. So, because the science of us, we can analyze videos, we can get numbers and so forth, but what it really comes down to is, does this person have their people now? Do they have mm. friends that they can lean on and turn to in good times and in bad, okay? And so those are kind of highlighting two projects that we're working on, but there's also issue of dissemination, right? So it's great if we're helping everybody here in Santa Barbara, uh, but that, that really only helps the people that are already lucky enough to have nice weather, right? <laughs> and so we need to do better, and so um, there's also a piece of when we have something that works really well, how do we get it in the hands of the people that need it the most? And so uh, there's a couple of initiatives on there. We've partially because of COVID, partially because we needed to just get things out there. We've taken a lot of our programs and created Zoom based versions of that. You know, everyone's favorite platform these days after two <laughs> years of COVID. Um, and actually seeing actually great results. We were kind of nervous. Our team's gonna wanna go back on Zoom after a whole day of Zoom. And it turns out if you can dial up the fun factor and actually put in activities they enjoy, they'll come back and they'll learn and they'll get better because of it. Uh, we were fortunate enough, the federal government funded us to create a smartphone app to um, package our early intervention model, pivotal response treatment, and put it in a device that people can access uh, in the palm of their hands. And so that's something that's gonna really scale up accessibility. We're doing a clinical trial right now to see, can we train parents all over the country using a device in their pocket so that they don't have to meet face-to-face -face with a professional. They don't have to work around that person's schedule. They don't have to coordinate different time zones and all of that too. So we're very excited in terms of not just does it work, but then that piece of how do we get it in the hands of the folks that need it the most. And that's, and, and we're not done innovating. I think one of the um, great things about working with doctoral students is they bring their own ideas into the mix. And we have lucky to have two of our graduate students back here. I'm gonna embarrass them a little bit. We have Maria and Sarah Lee, um, who are both doing pioneering work in terms of um, working, using telehealth to um, 
impact families that might be impacted by challenging behavior. And so Maria is doing a lot of work in that sphere in terms of uh, when there's challenging behavior, parents are often at a loss. I'm at a loss when my kids are misbehaving. And it's equipping them with practical tools that they can use immediately to connect with their kid, to um, engage in activities together, and ultimately create an environment where their kids don't need to rely on those strategies anymore. Okay. Sarah Lee's doing wonderful work in terms of um, translating our materials into Spanish um, and, and creating opportunities for Spanish-speaking families both here locally and then across the state, across the country to be able to access our early intervention uh, models as well. And so anybody who's been paying attention to things, uh, there's, there's racial and ethnic disparities when it comes to autism diagnosis, but then also access to care. And so we're working really hard to have a, a team that's addressing these issues head on. Okay. Uh, I know I've been doing a lot of talking here. I'll just I'll kind of wrap up. People often will talk to me about, okay, what, what's kind of your, your inspiration? Like what, what's driving you? And so I, I have four kids at, at home. And, Talk to my wife and I. That's uh, we agree that that's three kids too many. Okay? <laughs> that we, we, apparently, you can't return them afterwards, so we're kind of stuck with what we've got there. Yeah. But kind of a reoccurring question ever since they were itty bitty ones is, are they going to be okay? Um, and, and I think for uh, any parent, that's kind of a re reoccurring question. Uh, first day of preschool, and they're clinging to your leg and crying. Are they going to be okay? Right. Um, first sleepover. Uh, are they going to be okay? Uh, that's a big one. Uh, that just happened recently. Um, and then I, I've talked to parents of older kids, and suddenly there's that day when they're going off to college, and are they going to be okay? And um, they're potentially dating someone. You're like, whoa, what, what is happening? They were just these bitty ones. And are, are they going to be okay? And I, I think families that come through our center um, Sometimes it's for our assessment services and we're giving that diagnosis for the first time. Um, others are in a major life transition and their kid might be entering high school or college. Uh, and there's usually some form of that question. Is my kid going to be okay? Um, and so my goal and what I see kind of ultimately when we distill it down is to put together a top-notch team, um, let their ideas run wild so we can solve these, these practical problems that are facing all of these individuals at different life moments. Okay? So whether it's a toddler, a school age kid, a, an adolescent, an adult, um, I, I basically want to have a program ready to be just deployed and support that individual so they can have the best quality of life possible. And when a parent asks me that question, are they gonna be okay, that I can answer them with yes. Just thank you so much, and at this point, invite the, the Trumans to come up. So we actually have